What is up, people? Welcome to Unit 3. Now, I'm sure you remember our old friends, Supply and Demand. Well, in this unit, we meet their cousins, Aggregate Supply and Aggregate Demand. Don't forget to smash that like button for me, cuz. All right, so most of this unit, and in a lot of ways, most of our AP Macro course is centered around the ADAS model that we're gonna begin learning about. In this video, we're gonna start with aggregate demand. Now, that word aggregate means total. So aggregate demand refers to the total demand in the economy for all final goods and services. Okay, so here's our model. I've labeled the vertical axis P for aggregate price level. If you wanna label this as PL, APL, or write out the words aggregate price level, feel free to do so, but P works as well. Now, remember, this is a macro model. So this isn't the price of Jordans or AirPods or bad bunny posters. It's the overall price level in the economy as a whole. In unit two, we learned how to calculate the price level through things like CPI. Well, here we're taking that same measurement and we're graphing it. The horizontal axis is Y for real GDP. If you prefer to write RGDP or aggregate output, that's fine. I like Y. So the horizontal axis is showing us how much stuff an economy is producing, while the vertical axis shows us how much that stuff costs which means that we'll be able to see if there's been any inflation. Again, we're really just graphing stuff that we learned about in Unit 2. And for those of you really astute observers, you may have realized that we're missing the third of our big measurements, unemployment. Well, kind of. But remember that output and unemployment are negatively or inversely related. So if we know what happens to output, that means we always know that the opposite happens to unemployment. And finally, here's our aggregate demand curve. And you'll notice that it's downward sloping, just like our demand curve. This shows that there's a negative relationship between the price level and aggregate demand. And that makes sense because we buy more stuff at low prices than we do at high prices, right? Now, the AD curve represents total spending in the economy. And we don't care who's doing that spending or what they're spending it on. So we can say that AD equals C plus I plus G plus XN. Now, hopefully that sounds familiar because that also just happens to be our main GDP calculation. So all spending in an economy is captured by AD, aggregate demand, whether it's done by households, firms, governments, or people in foreign countries. There are three reasons why the aggregate demand curve is downward sloping, but I wanna start by pointing out something that's not one of those reasons. You might remember that one of the reasons the demand curve is downward sloping is because of the substitution effect, meaning that when the price of a good rises, consumers substitute away from that good and towards a cheaper alternative. The reason that doesn't work for the AD curve is that the AD curve includes the demand for all goods already, so substitution can't explain what's happening here. I point that out because it's a common mistake and it makes for a really good trick answer on a multiple choice question. So I just want you to be prepared for that. The reasons the AD curve is downward sloping are known as the real wealth effect, the interest rate effect, and the exchange rate effect. So let's define each of these. The real wealth effect basically is referring to your purchasing power. At a higher price level, people can't afford to buy as much stuff. So we move up along the AD curve and we see that aggregate demand is lower. And at a lower price level, we can buy more, so we slide down the AD curve and aggregate demand is greater. The interest rate effect is something we'll explore a lot more in Unit 4. But basically, when the price level is lower, people are able to save more money as well, and that pushes interest rates down. And that increases the amount of borrowing, and in turn, the amount of spending that takes place. But don't worry too much about that one right now. The exchange rate effect is something we'll explore more in Unit 6. But basically, as the domestic price level rises, it means things are more expensive, not just for people in this country, but also for people in foreign countries. So this leads to a decrease in U.S. exports, which means a lower level of aggregate demand. And when the price level falls, it makes American goods cheaper in foreign countries as well. So people in foreign countries buy more, and this means a higher level of aggregate demand in the United States. And so lastly, let's talk about what shifts the AD curve. And I have good news. Remember when I said that AD equals C plus I plus G plus XN? Well, those are our shifters of AD. That means that the AD curve will increase and shift right when consumer spending, investment spending, government spending, or net exports increase. And AD will decrease and shift left when consumer spending, investment spending, government spending, or net exports decrease. 
We can also point out a couple of other ways to describe these determinants. For example, changes in wealth affect AD. If people become wealthier, perhaps because of a booming stock market or rising home values, consumer spending increases. If the stock market or home prices crash, consumer spending decreases. Expectations also matter. When households and firms are more optimistic, consumer and investment spending increase. When they're pessimistic or they're worried about the future, consumer and investment spending decrease. Government policies matter as well. We'll talk more about this later in the unit, but fiscal policy is the term for government tax and spending policies, and these affect AD. Expansionary fiscal policy is designed to increase AD and includes increases in government spending, tax cuts, and increases in government transfers. And each of these shift AD to the right. And the opposite policies, cutting government spending, raising taxes, and reducing transfers are called contractionary fiscal policy, and these all shift AD to the left. There's also monetary policy, but that's unit four stuff, so I really don't want to get into that too much beyond simply saying that it also affects AD and can be expansionary or contractionary, with expansionary policy increasing AD and contractionary policy reducing it. All right, so that should be a really solid starting point for unit three, so until next time, this has been a La Money production. Thanks again for watching. Please hit that like button. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Ring the bell for notifications and check out the description to get answers to these practice questions, as well as links to some of the great study aids I've made for you. And I will see you in the next video.